Hi, I'm delighted to see so many wonderfully attractive people in one room. It really makes my heart quite glad. Uh, this is also just about the first time I've escaped from the exhibition hall this week, and I'm delighted that it is for this keynote session. And so, without any Glaswegian interlude this time, I'm delighted to introduce to you professors, Professor Peter Walker from New York University and Professor Mark Taylor from Flinders University, who I'm sure are going to give us a thrilling keynote symposium. Good afternoon and thank you very much for the introduction and also uh, thank you very much indeed for this uh, distinct pleasure in inviting uh, Mark Taylor and myself to give this lecture and for having such a terrific uh, turnout. When I go to surgeon meetings at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, you're lucky if you get 20 people in the audience, you know, so uh, this is quite a difference. The importance of knee biomechanics um, I started doing biomechanics in the 1960s and uh, with a strong connection with the University of Strathclyde. I did my PhD at the University of Leeds and my uh, external examiner was Professor Robert Kennedy who founded the bioengineering department at uh, University of Strathclyde. And I have to say, even though he was a delightful person, he was very, very, very tough. So I did not have an easy passage in my PhD. But I've put here the importance of knee biomechanics in total knee design because although historically total knee replacements, and there's probably hundreds of them being invented, mostly by surgeons, especially in the earlier days, but as time went on, it became very evident that engineers were playing an important role and in fact should play an important role, the application of engineering principles and design methodology to something like total knee design was clearly going to result in a superior end result. And I have to say, we're still progressing in this endeavor. It's customary to give disclosures. Um, I don't know whether any of them are influencing my talk, but here they are. The talk outline then, First of all, I'd like to just briefly characterize the problem of arthritis of the knee. On the left-hand column, you can have mild to moderate arthritis, which can be treated either non-operatively or with biological treatments, but also with implants, and I'd like to say a few words about that. At the right-hand side, moderate to severe arthritis is usually treated with a total knee, and it's been incredibly successful since about 1970, what well, that's 45 years of tremendous success and it shows no signs of abating and in fact the usage goes up between 5 and 10 percent per year still. I'd like to talk about early designs and new designs and I'd like to talk about moving on to surgical techniques and evaluation methods. So identifying the problem then, I think one of the important factors in causing osteoarthritis, i.e. wearing out, if you like, if we can call it wearing out, loss of cartilage, usually mostly on the medial side of the knee. Um, one of the factors is varus overload, as demonstrated by Bergman and others in Berlin, who I visited recently, and uh, they've done incredible groundbreaking work on instrumented tibial components to measure the forces across the knee in numerous different activities. This has been an incredibly important contribution to the field of biomechanics as a whole. The result of that is progression of medial cartilage loss. We collaborated in our hospital with the Department of Rheumatology that had a significant cohort of patients who had different degrees of osteoarthritis from mild to severe. We looked at the MRI scans and uh, we reconstructed the cartilage layers and the pictures you see here show a progression. We selected cases representing the progression at number one, which is a normal knee, 
um, which showing the cartilage thickness, red being thick, green being relatively thin, to the bottom right where we see distinct cartilage loss down to bone on the center of the distal end of the femur and over the major central area of the tibia. This is very, very typical of all these cases that we looked at. Another result of the varus overloading is remodeling of the bone, and you can see here sections through the bone showing increased density on the medial side, but in particular, density near the top surface. In other words, the density as you go down into the bone falls off quite rapidly, which means that if you want to place an implant and you resect, say, 10 millimeters from the surface of the tibia, you're removing most of the strong bony support from the top. So this is a quandary for designing implants such as unicompartmental knees, one of the disadvantages, you might say, of putting in a unicompartmental knee, even though they are indeed fairly successful in practice. But having said that, we felt that uh, a early intervention knee, a local resurfacing, taking into account the areas of cartilage degeneration would be a useful implant to use. So we designed this implant, which simply re resurfaces the distal end of the femur and the proximal end of the tibia. But those of you who know a little bit about total joint replacement will realize that mostly tibia, the, the tibia is mostly where the polyethylene is. In other words, we have a component at least eight millimeters thick, six millimeters of polyethylene, two millimeters of metal backing on the tibia, which means you've got to remove at least that much of tibial bone. Our design reverses these materials so we have a thin metallic component for the tibia to avoid resecting that strong tibial bone I just showed you. On the femur, we're allowed to have up to 10 millimeters of implant simply because if ever this has to be revised to a total knee, routinely 10 millimeters is resected from the distal end of the femur. So we call this a reverse materials implant. And in fact, the person who first invented this was not me at all. It was somebody incredibly distinguished who started off the whole area of joint replacements, namely Professor Sir John Charnley, who developed this implant in the very early 1970s, but he abandoned it simply because he was so involved with the hip joint that I think he just didn't feel he had the time to pursue this concept. And we've done a number of studies. You'll see at the bottom of the page, um, I show references um, for most of this work. Most of this work you'll see is referenced in uh, peer-reviewed journals. This is work done by one of my staff, uh, Miriam Chaudhary, recently a PhD. So what we've done here is look at the stresses and strains and strain energy density on the proximal tibia, comparing our new implant with different types of prevailing implants. And this is a very important concept. Whenever you're doing biomechanical studies of implants, you get results, yes, but what do they mean? It's best, I think, to analyze known implants with a known clinical history, if at all possible, so then you know the meaning of such and such stresses result in this clinical outcome after five or 10 years. That gives us a handle, if you like, on the significance of the data that we find in the analyses. So what we find out then, not surprisingly of course, is that the stresses and strains on the bone are more favorable and more like normal when we use relatively thin metallic components and especially the big green bar shows a all plastic inlay which has very high local stresses, again not surprisingly. That's the finite element with the red center as you can see. And in fact, clinically, it does correlate with pain, a higher, much higher incidence of pain in the patients. But to design an implant like this, you have to design the correct curvatures. So how do we design the correct curvatures? It's actually much easier than designing a total knee where you, where you have many surfaces to match. This is simply a problem of matching the surface on the distal end of the femur and the proximal end of the tibia. So we decided to find out what is the average surface? What's the average knee look like? So this multicolored picture shows 
MRI scans of 20 normal knees of the femur overlaid in a, a software called Geomagic. I'm sure many of you have heard of this uh, incredible piece of software. Geomagic will perform averaging by taking lots of points all around the periphery, if you like, and generating a new point cloud. So we can generate what's called an average normal femur. And we've validated the robustness of this method by averaging these 20 knees in many different ways, taking little groups, big groups, and so on and so on. You always end up with the same answer within half a millimeter or so. And we've done the same for the tibia. So we have an average femur and an average tibia. So what we can do then is to, is to design a five-size system, right? just five sizes, where we take the surface radii, etc., and we then put the implant into each of these 20 knees, and we've done this on lots of other knees also, and see how accurately we can fit a population of knees. The answer is we can fit the periphery of these implants to, in the vast majority of cases, with, with an error of less than 0.5 millimeters. So what it shows is it is possible to design these implants to be very, very accurate with only a very limited number of sizes. But for total knees, it's a little more complex. Um, we first of all should start off with a design criteria. How should the total knee move in vivo? There's many other criteria, but I'm selecting motion as the main criteria in this talk. We should also have a means of synthesizing and optimizing a total knee. How is that done? It is a creative process. I don't know that we have a systematic method of downloading a computer software program that says design a total knee. I don't believe we have something like that. It's conceivable. And then we have a testing method. How are we going to test it? You've come up with your design. How do we test it to find out whether it fits the design criteria? Now, I'm, I'm taking you back now to about 1970 to 1973. I worked at the Hospital for Special Surgery after Leeds, and we started off by looking at the laxity of the normal intact knee. If you look at the left-hand side, what we found out was that if you take a knee and measure the laxity, that means push it anterior, posterior, or internal, external, it's loose. How loose is it? The fact is that the looseness reduces as the compression load across the knee increases. Why is this? At that time, we thought it was what we call the uphill principle. In other words, as you move the knee anterior posterior, the condyles, especially on the medial side, the femoral condyles are moving uphill, uphill, uphill against gravity when you have a compression load acting. So I designed the condyles of the total condylar knee. We, this was one of the very first knees designed. The total condylar knee would have to have surfaces which would produce this same phenomenon of increased stability, reduced laxity under load with the radii of curvature. So that's what we did. We assumed, and the surgeons that I worked with indicated they would rather resect the, the cruciate ligament. So, what you need is an implant that has AP stability, but some laxity and mimicking the anatomical characteristic. This total knee design was used in tens, if not hundreds of thousands of cases. Here is a picture. I asked Chit Rano at my colleague in New York, uh, could he send me a long-term follow-up? This is a 30-year follow-up. You'll notice the tibial component has metal backing, but initially it was all plastic. These implants have had approximately 85 to 95, 85 to 90% survival at 15 and 20 years, which is quite incredible. And he's recently looked at 30-year follow-ups, and there's many patients still getting around after 30 years. So the designer of the total condylar knee was John Insel, Chit Ranawat, and myself, and that was in about 1970 to 73. Um, there was a slight limitation of the design. It, it, it would only get to about 90 degrees of flexion. And in some cases, if the surgery wasn't done right, it would have anterior subluxation a little bit. So it, the femur would skid forwards a little bit on the tibia. So we designed a thing called the stable or condylar at that time for a different application. It was for more seriously unstable knees. But we then adapted 
the intercondylar post and cam of the femur to a kinematic stabilizer design which would provide anterior posterior stability in flexion. Notably, it would make the femur roll back in flexion. So that was called the kinematic stabilizer. Later on, Al Burstein um, used the same idea to design the IB knee, and that has become incredibly successful. So the IB type knees, CAM post designs, are now number one in the world using the total condylar bearing surfaces and the intercondylar stability. These are now the designs used in the large majority of cases. But around about that time in the 80s, I felt that the knee is asymmetrical. Why are we designing symmetrical prostheses? Isn't the medial side different from the lateral? Isn't the motion asymmetric? So we did many studies um, and found out that indeed the knee acted a bit like a medial pivot. So I designed some computer software at that time where you could generate a femoral surface from averaging, again, average, slicing up knees and taking average sections. So I had an average femur and then moved it through the average motion path to generate tibial surfaces. So they would be the surfaces of the tibial implant. So not surprisingly, the, tibial, the, the medial side turned out to be very dished and the lateral side turned out to be very shallow. Now, we then designed the Kinemax knee system, but the manufacturers were not having any of this asymmetry because it doubles the inventory. So we had to have symmetrical designs, but nevertheless, perhaps it should be asymmetric. Still later, I designed a, another concept, which is actually came from the Japanese. I think it was embedded in my mind at a Japanese conference I went to once. But I said, well, if you make the condyles converging, the femoral condyle, if you make the peak of the surface converging inwards as you flex, Maybe you can generate a tibial surface so that when the femur flexes, it will roll back, excuse me, on the lateral side. That's on the lateral side. It'll roll back if you make it converging. And indeed, it does that. So I generated some surfaces which I call the converging condyles concept. And using these methodologies, um, we were able to come up with some early designs of what I call guided motion knees. Now, on the left side, you'll see a standard condyla, a standard posterior stabilized, and then a guided motion PS, and then a guided motion ramp. In other words, you can start now to design different configurations, if you like, of intercondylar guiding surfaces. On the right-hand side, you see the contact patches, and you can see on the extreme right, you'll see the medial side remaining more or less in the same point as the knee flexes. But on the left side, the red blobs show a progressive posterior rolling back of the contacts on the lateral side. Posterior roll back on the lateral side. That's called the neutral path of motion. Finally, the third criteria was how do you test it? Now, the only test machine at that time um, that, that was used in this manner was the Oxford-type rig. But we started to think, we want to represent more different types of activity. So on the bottom left, we have the neutral path of motion, whereas the knee flexes and extends under just compression load. The lateral side rolls back, and the medial side is constant. But also, about that neutral path, you can have AP laxity, and you can have internal, external, rotational laxity. So the top row shows the machine, the concept of a machine, where you would flex and extend the knee under compression, you then apply shear, you then apply posterior shear, you then apply internal rotation, etc. And you would measure the motion of the transverse axis of the femur and all the contact points as a descriptor of the motion. Now, just to give you an idea of what the transverse axis looks like, and this is the Oxford machine now, which we were using at that time. At the bottom right, you see, excuse me, at the top right, you see a normally intact knee with a fan shape of the transverse axis. The medial side fairly constant, 
the lateral side rolling back with flexion. If you cut the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, the motion turns out to be more or less parallel. Now, if you look at this one, this one here, the posterior stabilized, it has pretty much parallel motion. Not surprising because the condyles are parallel. But if we look at this design here, the guided motion design, it replicates uh, an intact normal knee. So in other words, guided motion can replicate the neutral path of motion of a normal intact knee, as opposed to the most popular designs which were being used. So we built a test machine which does all those things in sequence. It'll flex and extend, apply all the forces. We also, when we're designing these, we 3D print them, these red things in the middle at the right-hand side. We 3D print them to simulate ligaments cruciate ligaments, sorry, collateral ligaments, we have springs. Similarly, if, if we want to reproduce the cruciate ligaments. It's much more pleasant to do testing with springs than with cadavers. I think everybody who's tested with cadavers realizes how messy it is. So we come up then with a design criterion, which is a benchmark, if you like, of the motion. This is an average of 10 knees. This is work done by Sally Arno. Um, I reconfigured her work. She tested 10 knees to look at the meniscus. And, um, but in doing so, we went through all the motion paths of the intact knee. So you can see the transverse axis of motion laterally and medially. And this is the laxity about the neutral path. In other words, the medial condyle about the neutral path can go backwards a few millimeters and the lateral side can go forwards about five to eight millimeters. So this here provides a benchmark. This is the kind of motion we want to see from an artificial knee. That's the criterion. If you design an artificial knee, rightly or wrongly, the criterion I'm proposing is that it will imitate the neutral path of motion and it will have the normal laxity. <clears throat> the value of the methodology is it represents lots and lots of different loading conditions under lots and lots of different activities. That's the, whole, the point of the whole test, rather than simulating individual activities. Interestingly enough, I, uh, I found this, old, this picture I had from special surgery in about, uh, with working with Peter Bullough. And look at the wear pattern, if you like, on the, on the medial side, bang in the center. And look at the wear pattern on the lateral side. It, it's most in the middle, but then it comes posterior. And look at the motion path, constant on the medial side, and rolling back on the lateral side. It's quite amazing how the wear of the cartilage in, the, in this N of 1, but it's a beautiful illustration, if you like. Again, uh, in the, uh, after 2000, I decided that we needed an enhanced method of designing knees, and um, so I came up with this methodology here, where you design a femoral component, whatever your femoral component is, and then move it through the neutral path of motion and the laxity path, turn it upside down, drape it, and then you generate the tibial surface. Now, that's not the full story, but it's the general principle of the methodology that I've been using to design artificial knees. And then I use this method now to design a short list, if you like, of different kinds of guided motion knees. First of all, a saddle to reproduce the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, a ramp, which is much nicer than a tall post, an alternate to the cam post, and here's the converging condyle, and here's our favorite, most popular design, the cam post mechanism with a dished medial side and shallow lateral side and a rounded cam post. So this is, at the moment, a short list of designs. But why don't we go one step further? Why don't we say, let's make sure the components fit nicely in the knee. In other words, let's have them with anatomical surfaces. The reason for that is you want the ligaments and soft tissues and muscles to flow over the implant at all angles of flexion as it would in the normal anatomical knee. So we use the data that I showed you earlier with those multicolored knees of the average knees so just to design an hour, I mean, we could design a patient-specific knee, I suppose, if we wanted to, but at the moment, we're all into averages. So 
here's the average knee, and here's the average total knee replacement, and we can design our bearings, our guided motion bearing surfaces on the end of that. Now, we're assuming we get rid of the cruciates because the surgeons like it that way, especially for mild to severe cases. So, so this is the final design of where I'm at at the moment. Nothing's ever quite final, but this is surfaces which blend with the bone surfaces. So this is the anatomic replica knee. And it has three pairs of guiding surfaces. It has the lateral guiding surfaces, which rely on gravity as well as shape. It has the intercondylar guiding surfaces, like a saddle, and it has the medial guiding surfaces to prevent anterior subluxation and to limit posterior subluxation. And it does, we've tested it in our machine, in our uh, holistic test machine, and sure enough, it replicates very closely the benchmark data we got from the normal intact knees. In, in other words, as you flex it, the lateral side rolls back and the medial side remains more or less constant and the laxity patterns are also very, very similar. Now I'm, you know, adjusting it a little bit here and there, but this design here seems to replicate the laxity and the neutral path of motion using guiding surfaces. So it's not a simple problem. We've used three pairs, three pairs of guiding surfaces to achieve this motion. Now I just want to give acknowledgement to uh, many people in the past who have worked on different types of asymmetric knees, David Blaha with his medial pivot knee, Mike Freeman, who has really come up with an incredible number of insights. If you want to look at some amazing new work, recent, relatively recent but also older work on knee mechanics and design, just Google uh, Michael Freeman on your database. Um, but there's many other people as well. Um, Ryan Willing, optimization. Um, we've got some Korean group who have actually come up with the same idea uh, of imitating the anatomic shapes. We have Fitzpatrick and Rolkoeta at Kansas coming up with some beautiful computer models for modeling knee, in other words, doing numerous tests in silico rather than on the bench. And Mark Taylor, uh, who will obviously speak for himself on what he's doing. So here we are then. This is where the world is today with total knee replacement. I'm on a team with Zimmer called the Persona Knee Team, and there's 23 surgeons and two engineers, Phil Noble and myself. Gil Scuderi is one of the most prominent surgeons, does beautiful surgery. And here is the Persona PS Total Knee, a symmetrical design. Despite the fact that we all know the knee is asymmetric, it's a bearing surface-wise symmetric design. So the big question is, where do we go from here? I mean, the, these symmetric PS designs are uh, about 60% uh, of the market, about 30% of the market are CR designs where they retain the posterior cruciate ligament, still a symmetrical design, and the rest are various other things like mobile bearing knees, etc. So how do we compare different total knee designs? How do we do it in the laboratory? What's the best way of doing it in the laboratory? I've come up with some ideas of the holistic test machine, but what are the best methods to compare different knee designs? How to optimize a particular knee design? But then most importantly, how to evaluate a total knee for functional performance? I mean, let's supposing you were able to do the experiment and I had arthritis and you put in five different total knees in my knee, I could tell you how, how well I play different sports, etc with those five different knees. You can't do those experiments. In other words, it's, it's very difficult to evaluate and find out the added value of, for example, an asymmetrical design compared to a symmetrical design. It's going to require large numbers to do that and some very, very careful experiments, some very careful, uh, meaningful evaluation methods on the patients. We can do it in the laboratory very precisely with test machines or computer models but how to do it on the patients? I think that's a big question facing us today. How to evaluate the patients to find out which is really giving us the best performance. Now, I was gonna tell you all about surgery, and I'm just gonna flick through the slides to show you we've done our homework on surgery because 
I think surgical technique, no matter how good your knee is, unless you balance the knee, you're not going to get the best re results. Now, balancing, by the way, I want to show you this one slide. On the top left is pre-balancing. This is supposed to be 0.5. So knees are hideously balanced when you start the surgery. At the end of the surgery, you still can't get them perfectly balanced. The ligaments are just impossible to balance. But you can get a much, much better spread. You can reduce the standard deviation about the mean considerably. And the, this slide here, to evaluate one of the simplistic methods we're using to evaluate the patients for balancing in the clinic, in the clinic, is we've invented this stretch sensor knee fixture to measure varus and valgus deviations. So that's one of the methods apart from the evaluation forms. And this is the sort of data we get. You do not get symmetrical varus and valgus. Now any lab, as you know, relies on its staff. And I've been the beneficiary of numerous hundreds of students, fellows, etc., over the years. And I really think it's terrific to be able to work with young people like this and supervise PhDs, MSCs, part-time workers, summer workers, and so on and so on. And of course, working with orthopedic surgeons. I have some wonderful colleagues who are orthopedic surgeons. And uh, this is just an incredible field which gives a lot of pleasure and provides a t tremendous output for engineering technology. So I just thank you very much for your attention. So after that uh, excellent talk, I think given that an uh, the, the difficult task of trying to look towards the future and how do we improve total knee joint replacement design, it could be a very short talk. Um, it's fairly safe to say that knee replacement is a, a mature technology. Uh, we have over 40 years of experience. And the headline figures are that we have 95% survivorship at 10 years. Um, this is a case in point. This is actually my mother's knee. So, 14 years ago, she underwent total knee replacement, and actually, Professor Walker probably recognizes this design. It's one of his. And like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of joint replacement patients uh, each year, following surgery, it really was a remarkable uh, improvement in her mobility and reduction of pain. Um, however, the headline figures don't tell us everything. So I said that we have only 5% failures at 10 years. Actually, if you look at the influence of age, um, if you're over 70, 75, uh, at 10 years, you only have a 1 in 50 chance of the fact that your knee replacement will actually be revised. However, if you're a younger patient, you're under 55, you actually have a 1 in 10 chance that in the first 10 years, you're going to require revision surgery. And there is a clear correlation between how old you are and when you receive your joint replacement and whether you're going to, uh, how quickly you're, you're likely to get it revised. Also, in comparison with hips, the function of knee replacements isn't so good. It's very anecdotal. But um, if you ask a hip replacement patient which joint they've had replaced a number of years after surgery, many will find it difficult to tell which joint they've had replaced. If you ask a knee replacement patient, many will point directly to their knee. And many patients complain of poor function, so they're not able to do the things they want to do. Most are a, ret a retired population, and so they want to go off and do their gardening. And they have difficulty kneeling, and so they can't do the things they want to do. Also. Knee replacement patients are becoming younger, so rather than being over 65, we are seeing the average age creeping down into the 60s. So we are seeing younger and more active patients demanding total knee replacement. And so that faces us with some challenges moving forwards. When I was trying to prepare for this talk, um, I was overwhelmed by the number of things that I could talk about. I'm going to focus on two aspects only. The first one is, um, Recognizing that we have 95% survivorship at 10 years, how are we going to assess whether a new implant is actually at least as good as, if not better, than those currently available on the market? So I'm going to try and answer a more design-specific question. But also in this talk, I'm going to try and address whether, what can we do for the individual patient? So can we use technology 
and the existing designs of implants that we have out there to try and maximize the outcome for that patient to ensure that they get the longevity that they deserve. Again, it's difficult to cover all aspects, and I'm going to focus on one particular aspect. Peter has talked very eloquently about um, kinematics and function. I'm actually going to focus more on fixation, and particularly related to tibial trays. And I'm going to talk about cementless tibial trays, because we've done some work in this area. The reason I'm going to focus on this is because cementless tibial trays have a very clean-cut failure mode. And that's usually failure to become osteointegrated in the first place. So you aren't able to achieve primary stability. And it's an easy metric to look at, because we can look at the micromotion and the strains of the bone implant interface to evaluate what's going on. Early designs of cementless knee replacement actually uh, had very poor uh, clinical outcomes with very high rates of migration and um, uh, high rates of aseptic loosening. However, the modern era, we have seen uh, some very good designs coming out, and there's some clinical evidence to suggest that they actually perform as well as, if not slightly better, than comparable cemented devices. However, we do st still do see uh, things like radiolucencies. So, Oops, let's see if I can get this to work. Can you see the black line here? This is a radiolucency. So this is where bone hasn't grown up to the implant, which is what we hope it should do. And that suggests that the mechanical environment is suboptimal at that interface, and so there is still room for improvement. So, like I say, how do we assess if a new implant is at least as good as, if not better than those currently available? So what tools do we have available to us at the moment? And really, it splits down to, as Professor Walker has already described, um, kind of the balance between in vitro testing and finite element analysis. In vitro testing, um, it has the advantages that we're actually working with real bones. Um, but the disadvantages are that we only can measure very limited parameters. Usually, if we're looking at micromotion, we can only assess that at one or two points over the interface surface. Um, and we can only look at small groups of bones. Often, we're also using very simplistic loading conditions, which are perhaps not representative of what happens in vivo. In comparison, uh, if we look at finite element analysis, if you go through the literature, 99% of all FE studies that are performed, I would say use what I'll term as the single representative bone uh, type of analysis. We take CT scans of a single bone, and then we make predictions about the micromotions, and then we try and project those onto a larger patient population. FE has the advantage of the fact that we can look at the micromotion anywhere at the, the surface, and we can apply a much more uh, complex load cases, but it is a numerical model, and there's always that question mark about does the numerical model actually represent physical reality. This is a graph from the late and great uh, Rick Hauschkes, um, and I really like this, and I recommend that you go back and read this paper. Rick Hauschkes recognized the problem we have in trying to evaluate modern joint replacement more than 20 years ago. And it's quite eloquently uh, represented in this diagram. We basically have a mechanical failure can be represented as this uh, fight between the stress versus strength. And basically, the failures occur at the interface where our stresses start coming down into the area where our strength is low. The problem we have now in modern joint replacement is that this zone where we get an overlap between our stresses or our micromotions and our strength or our uh, failure criteria, this is tiny. If we've got 5% failures at 10 years, you know, this zone is very, very small. So how can we evaluate this using our techniques? If we do in vitro testing, we're testing 5, 10 bones maybe, if we're looking at FE analysis using a single representative femur, at best, we're not predicting this. We're probably looking at the mean value or somewhere in this distribution. We're certainly not exploring the whole distribution. And this is a problem. We can't evaluate modern joint replacements using these techniques because we're not capturing the distribution properly. So this means that we have to start adopting probabilistic and stochastic tools in order to capture the variation, whether it be surgical variation or patient variation, in order to properly evaluate new implant devices. And we've started to do this. So I'm not going to talk about the surgical variability, but I am going to talk about the population-based studies. So rather than using a single femur, or a single, sorry, a single tibia in this case, 
um, we have started looking at using population-based FE modeling. And this is an emerging technique. At the moment, there are only three um, cases in the literature which this has been done. One of those has been done on a resurfaced femoral head. We've done some work on the proximal implanted tibia, and actually some former colleagues at the University of Southampton have gone on to look at femoral stems. And the idea of this is, is that rather than looking at a single femur, we now look at population is perhaps a little grand. It's a larger cohort of bones which are representative of the patient cohort that they're likely to be implanted into. So this is an example of one such study that we've done. Um, this was actually a comparative study where we looked at three different implant designs, um, all from Depew. They actually all have um, at least 10, well, sorry, two of the designs have 10-year clinical data, and one of the designs has good clinical follow-up. The population-based studies work on the fact that you have to have a population of bones that you can implant. Um, early on, we actually worked on using a statistical representation of our bones. So we had a statistical model which described not only the geometry, but also the material properties within the tibias, which we could then perturb to synthetically generate a larger population. Actually now, uh, with larger and uh, more available CT data sets uh, becoming available, we can actually just do this on real CT data rather than synthetically generating populations like we did in this study. The challenge we have, though, is that the pipeline is still a little clunky. Um, yes, we can generate uh, models of tibias, but we actually need to implant those tibias. Uh, and uh, although I had a PhD student who worked on a proximal femur, uh, and he manually implanted 17, thankfully at a very high Borden threshold, when we're starting talking about populations, we just can't do this manually. So we have to find a methodology to go through and do this in an automated fashion. And at the moment, that method usually means we have to skip around between different uh, pieces of software in order to uh, achieve that goal. But we can, and so we can go through and orientate components, size them properly, regenerate our mesh, and then use it to study RFE uh, results. The next challenge we have is actually applying loading and boundary conditions. When we look at applying it in a single representative tibia, we tend to take you know, uh, Georg Bergman has talked here uh, uh, yesterday, we tend to take the loads from uh, Bergman's data and apply them to the proximal tibia. We can't apply the same loads. We want to look at the variation of loads across a population. So we used another statistical model, which was actually derived from musculoskeletal model of a group of um, osteoarthritic knee patients, uh, which described the variation in the knee joint contact forces. We looked at six degree of freedom loading, so rather than using simple load cases, we actually applied the full six degree of freedom loads, and we applied those over a full gait cycle. The other important thing is we looked at um, the variation of weight. Um, if you look at the England and Wales joint registry, uh, the average BMI of a joint replacement patient is now at 29, so they're already in the overweight category, um, and actually a significant portion are actually obese or clinically obese. Uh, and we need to account for that in our studies if we're going to properly evaluate them. So what do we get out now when we start looking at those patient population type studies? Um, first of all, we can look at the range of, um, in this case it was micromotion at the bone implant interface on the resected surface, and we can see the, the, the extremes. So what's the minimum micromotion across the three designs versus the maximum micromotion? But what we can also do is look at the distributions across the three designs. And what we can see here is, is that one design is clearly performing worse than the other two. And this design has a much more robust behavior in comparison with the other two. And so that's useful, and we can start using this to understand how a device will behave. What we can do is we can start using this now as a benchmark. And with all benchmarks, we have to try and relate this back to some clinical reality if we can. And so, like I said, Thankfully, these three designs have actually uh, clinical data to support them. And what we know is, is that actually the LCS, the one that was shown to have the worst clinical behavior, actually has uh, a higher incidence of radiolucencies compared to the other two designs and actually has a marginally higher revision rate. Although it's not a direct validation, it does give me a warm, fuzzy feeling that our models are starting to predict in the right direction. And we can use these now to compare new implant designs. So if we have a new implant design, we don't want to be here. We want to be here. And so we can use that as a benchmark to evaluate our designs. 
So, the next question. Um, how can we maximize the outcome for an individual patient? There is no doubt there has been an evolution in uh, the way that TKR surgery or knee arthroplasty is actually performed. Um, conventional surgery is still actually um, the lion's share of all surgery. So I think uh, in Australia, 80% of all surgery is still done using conventional surgery. But we have computer-aided or navigated surgery now. We have the custom patient instrumentation programs where you have custom-made jigs that only fit that patient to speed up the operation. And we have robotic surgery, like the Mako uh, robots, which actually go in and ensure that you get a robust um, uh, clinical um, surgery performed so you try and remove the outliers. And there's a whole host of other technology. We've heard about motion capture, you know, uh, activity monitors, and all of this can feed into the information that we capture about a patient. The problem is, um, I don't think that our surgical planning has actually progressed over the past 40 years. So at the moment, we are still really um, reconstruct reconstructing geometry. So the majority of planning, whether it be um, using conventional surgery or whether it's using these more advanced technologies, is really about restoring mechanical alignment and it's about restoring the soft tissue balances. We don't use the information that we capture about the patient particularly to actually try and optimize the outcome for that individual patient. And so we still rely to a certain extent on the, 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 um, the surgeon's experience to uh, guide us through that planning process. This is a flow chart that uh, was generated from a European project that I led uh, back in, and it finished back in 2009. So I'm a computational modeler. I'm very biased. And I truly believe that computational modeling can help us move towards actually improving the planning process. Being honest, the outcomes of this European project, even if I'm generous, I would say that we proved a proof of concept. Okay? We showed that we could take data, say MRI, CT, we could use it to adapt a generic model, which we could then generate a patient-specific model. We could then generate um, a musculoskeletal model, which then fed a finite element model to make some predictions. And in theory, you know, if you got a good result, you could move on. If you got a bad result, you could reorientate the components. But actually, the, the methodology we developed was fundamentally flawed. F to begin with, we relied on 3D imaging data. Even in the navigated surgery and kind of the more advanced technologies, it is not routine to collect that data, okay? It's rare that you actually get CT scans, and most surgeons are actually using just planar x-rays and you know, simple laxity tests to evaluate how their patient's performing. So if we're going to use these technologies, we actually need to use the routine assessment methods to actually uh, evaluate the patients to feed these models. The second problem we had was the fact that we made the assumption, the fact that for every single patient that went through the analysis or went through the planning process, we had to run a unique analysis. So we would take some input data, we would generate a musculoskeletal model, which predicted some forces, which we fed into the FE model, and then predicted some outcome, whether it be micromotion, uh, function, or um, where. The problem with that is, is the fact that all of you know that there is no uh, click and play kind of software out there which enables you to do this. And actually there's a lot of expertise in understanding how those mus musculoskeletal models work and also generating a finite element model for every single patient is just not feasible. It also begs another question and I think we adopted the wrong approach in a way and I think that there needs to be a change in mindset in when you're trying to um, develop a plan for an individual patient. When we started this, we kind of were working on theory that you have, you aimed at a deterministic number. So for each patient, you would measure, say, the micromotions of the bone implant interface, and you come up with some numbers, whether it be average or peak micromotions. And the problem is, is if you aim at some single deterministic number, you start then questioning, are the results valid? Are they accurate? Um, are the underlying assumptions in the model actually predicting the right things? And so you start questioning whether the model is good enough. I think what we need to do is change our mindset a little bit and actually view the fact that rather than predicting a single deterministic number and not compare it in comparison with anything else, is that we need to compare, okay, where is that subject on, or that individual patient 
on the population that they're actually related to. I think we need to adopt more of a, the approach we use for measuring osteoporosis and T-scores in femoral neck fracture, where you kind of evaluate, where is your patient? If they're over here, and we have some limits that we kind of accept that our prediction is made in, they're absolutely fine, and actually we don't need to worry. It's only perhaps when they go over the hump and start moving more towards here that perhaps we need to think about doing something slightly different with those patients. So if we take that mindset, I think it takes away from the fact that we need to have highly accurate models and perhaps that we can have perhaps less precise models and we can start making some uh, assumptions that we're, where we don't have to do individual muscle skeletal models, we don't have to do individual finite element models, but perhaps we can jump from the input data, whether it be geometry, soft tissue laxities, other information about the patient, use some sort of surrogate model and jump to the forces. If we know the forces, we can then use another surrogate model to jump from the forces to some prediction of the individual forces. So what is a surrogate model? It's very simple. Basically, we do lots of upfront calculations. We actually take uh, lots of femurs, tibias, we implant them, we make predictions, we use, record the input data, and we train a black box. And that black box can then be used if you only have the input data, it can spit out the results. This is a quick comparison of a prediction that we did on um, the implanted proximal tibia, looking at micromotion. This top row is the FE predictions of the variation of micromotion during a gait cycle. And the bottom one is our surrogate model predictions. And you can see they are very, very close, okay? The difference between them is the FE model takes 15 hours to run. Our surrogate model predictions, we can spit out in 30 seconds. So this means that we can now start thinking about using these perhaps in a clinical setting. And the, the other major difference is, is you don't need a trained uh, PhD student or uh, uh, postdoc who is familiar with running musculoskeletal models and FE analyses. All you need is somebody who can plug in numbers and you get a prediction spat out at the other end. My final slide, um, when I was trying to prepare for this talk, uh, I had a whole host of other things that came into my mind that needed to be talked about, but I just simply don't have time. But things that we also need to be thinking about. Infection is the second largest cause of revision. We need to be thinking about surface coatings, sensor technologies, to actually detect whether infection is actually occurring. Pain. Pain is a real hard one, okay? A third, 20% of patients actually suffer pain, and that's the cause for revision. How do we eliminate pain in joint replacement? Peter has already talked about early interventions and those technologies, so how can we extend the life of a normal knee? Telemedicine and post-operative care, how can we optimize the post-operative care of a patient to ensure that they are actually doing their physiotherapy and achieving the outcomes that they should do? And finally, uh, revision joint replacement. It actually isn't talked about much in the literature, but actually revision joint replacement has a three times higher failure rate than primary joint replacement. And so I think there's a huge amount of work we should be doing actually looking at the design of revision joint replacements uh, to improve those. And with that, I thank you and I'll conclude there.